Father, we bless you and we give you thanks and we give you praise for this time together, Lord. Judy Mott said Bob Marley was the Rasta who turned to Jesus. Welcome to this Music Shack's feature presentation of Judy Mott, Rasta turned to Jesus. I'm sitting here trying not to pinch myself because as you can see, my guest now is the incomparable Sister Judy Mowat. Welcome to Backyard TV's Music Shack. It's good to be here. I really thank God to be in the house with so many beautiful people and a beautiful woman like yourself. Oh my goodness, that's a compliment indeed. Ah, where to begin, where to begin? Let me <laughs> compose myself and get rid of the stars in my eyes. When we invited Judy Mott, to the Music Shack to do this special interview. We could never have imagined that we was gonna be in for so much big shockers and surprises. Wow. Jamaica in the mid 1970s, there was a dancer who wanted to be a singer and her name was Judy Mott. Judy Mott was obviously wise beyond her years and came up with a master strategy. She felt was the best way to get her in the music business. Judy believed that the best way of becoming a singer was to start it out as a dancer first, and it worked like a charm. Um, Sister Judy, you started out in the music industry in the 70s, correct? Yes. Not as a singer. Tell us how your, your start in, in the entertainment industry began and how you made that change from what you started with to where you ended up. Well, my entrance in the business, music business. I wanted to sing so badly, but I did not have the opportunity to go to a recording studio. So I calculated that if I take this route, it will get me into the music business. Mm -hmm. So I started dancing with a group called the Estralita Dancers. And it took us, we did folk dancing, we did bamboo dancing and it took me to Grand Cayman, it took me to different parts of the Caribbean. At a show she was dancing, someone told the promoter that she could sing and the promoter called her up to the mic. They were highly impressed and continues to call on her to sing. And then one concert we were doing in Jamaica and they told them that, they told the promoter that I can sing. Mm. And so I got an opportunity, still in my costume, my dance costume, I went out and I did some singing. One day Judy was walking on a street in the Kingston 2 area and heard guitar playing inside of a house. She decided to do the brave thing and knock on the gate to check things out. To Judy more surprise, here comes the great Henry III who immediately started writing a song for her. Her first song, Silent River Runs Deep, was written by the great Henry, not the eighth, but the third. And it was Silent River Runs Deep. Mm. And he gave me that song. Judy took the song to Federal Records, which is now known as Tough Gang, and recorded the song. So oh. I went down there and we recorded the song, Silent River Runs Deep. It was kind of difficult because I was very nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And um, it happened and it went to number one. That was your biggest hit yes, in Jamaica yes, with the Gaelets. With the group called the Gaelets. Judy, like so many other singers, have fallen victim to a record company's shady contract. When she realized that the contract she had signed with Federal Records was designed to renew itself every three years and trap her for the rest of her life. As I said, being with um, Federal Records, they made me sign a contract. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I had no legal awareness. And I really thought that I could have gotten out of the contract easily. Mm -hmm. But when I realized the contract was renewing itself every three years, My so I had no way of getting out of it. And they were not doing anything for me because they were signing other groups, other groups were recording. This time the Gaelists broke up. I wanted to go on with my life, but I was tied. I was shelved mm. by federal records. Mm. 
The record company didn't want to do anything else with Judy. They placed her on the shelf for a long time, just trying to hurt her until Lee Scratch Perry advised Judy to record under a new name. And so Lee Scratch Perry, um, the man professor, he, he came in. Yes, he's a professor. Man. <laughs> he came in and he suggested that I change my name. And so I changed my name from Judy Mowat to Julian. So for three years, I, I did um, recording in Under the name, that name of Julian. Julian. This is one of the most important story the Music Shack have ever done. Controversy was delivered, correction were made, oh man. Like this one that was widely reported that Judy was writing songs for Bonnie Judy set the record straight and tell us the real story. You also wrote some music for Bonnie Whaler. No, I did not. You didn't write for somebody no, under that a, name? That's a mistake. Okay. His girlfriend is Jean Watt. I saw that name mentioned. And Judy Mowat did the songs. Mm -hmm. So they really thought it was Judy Je Mowat who right. wrote the songs. Right. No, it's Jean Watt. So right now, Sister Judy Mowat is setting the record straight. Once and for all, you're going to hear it first. Backyard TV for Music Shack. So what then happened? How did you get out of that contractual obligation? Well, Barry Lee wanted to sign me, but he wasn't able to do that. Mm. And um, Miss Sonia Pottinger, she came to my rescue. So I recorded with Miss Sonia Pottinger as Julian. And I think after about three, four years, they never came after me again. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to change my name. Revert to your original to stage. Judy Moore. Right, right. Black woman, ooh, black woman. Like Must remind you that Judy was the first female reggae artist to produce her own album after realizing that no one wanted to touch her blend of songs. What propelled you into doing that in a male-dominated world? Well, I figured that the songs that I wanted to do because I became a Rastafarian and I was reading Marcus Garvey books. I was reading books on his Imperial Majesty and I had a certain amount of knowledge that I wanted to impart but nobody would want me to record those songs. So I decided that I'm going to save my money produce yourself. and produce my album myself. And that album that you came out with, Black Woman, um, which is still today critically acclaimed as one of the best albums of its time and perhaps today. As we dig deeper and deeper, the stories and answers we got from Judy just keep getting bigger and bigger and more interesting, also shocking and sometimes baffling. We wanted to know why Judy converted from Rastafari to Christianity and she was happy to share. You stopped singing what we call secular music um, after a 20 year, there was a, um, a conversion, so mm -hmm. to speak. Tell us about that Talk. because I know you were such a passionate follow of the Rastafarian faith. And then you have this conversion. Tell me how that came about. On the journey of life, we go through different changes. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the changes and the transformation is for, is for bad. These changes, even if we experience the bad, we can see the good that comes out of it because all things work for good to Those them that love God mm -hmm. and are called according to his purpose. So I go back to purpose again. But um, I remember toying with the feeling. I was a Rasta for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And after 22 years, I just felt restless. I felt unfulfilled. I felt there was no more satisfaction. And I'm saying, what is my life all about? I've given 22 years you know, to this doctrine but where am I going from here? And it felt as if the carpet that I was standing on was pulled from under my feet. And I didn't even know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that something was happening to me because I was yes. embracing Christianity. Judy was a passionate follower of the Rastafarian movement for 22 years. What could have made her convert? We wanted to know how this conversion took place. 
We wanted to know what happened that caused her to start embracing Christianity. Judy shared a story with us about listening to a cassette with Emperor Selassie and heard a very important message from Selassie himself. So, And I was going on a Sunsplash tour. I was on a Sunsplash tour and it was my day off. I was sitting at the back of the bus with my cousin Anisia. Somebody had given me a cassette with his Imperial Majesty, an interview with his Majesty. And I decided on the day off, there was a cassette player at the back of the bus. So I just slipped the cassette in and was listening. Mm. And one part in particular where the interviewer said, Your Majesty, why is it that people said that you are the return Messiah? And he, he answered with his interpreter. And he answered and said, I am a mere man, and I will be replaced by the oncoming generation. And a human being should not be emulated for a deity. Mean a human mm. being should not be seen. I am a human being. Don't see me as, as a, a deity. God. Don't see me as a god. And I looked at my cousin. I said, "Annie, did you hear that?" She didn't answer. But I think we were frightened in ourselves because all these years you'd never heard that message before. We were before. worshiping this man, and mm. we never heard that before. So tell me, what do you think? Did you get the same understanding from that message? Is Selassie really saying that he's not the Messiah? I wonder if the rest of them would have anything to add or anything to say about the statement. Well, one thing we're sure, Judy believes that was the tape that locked the door to Selassie and opened the door to Jesus. What it did, it locked that door, that door for Rasta. It locked mm. that door and it opened a new door and that door was for Jesus Christ. Um, and then my tribulation started. She also felt she made the right choice when she noticed that she started to experience troubles very much like Jesus did. It got so bad at time that Judy felt like she wanted to die, but was just too weak to take her own life. I started to experience some, <coughs> some things that I never knew that I would experience. And I felt I wanted to die but I didn't have the strength to take my own life. My experience took me to different churches. And I just went into these churches to sit down and to just hear what the pastor is saying. And two churches in particular, I heard the pastor said, there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, but by the name of Jesus Christ. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I heard it in the same thing I heard in two different churches. Testify, Sister Julie, testify. I don't have to hear anything more. This is what it's going to do for me. It's going to transform in my life, and I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. And that was what I did. Because I just knew that this was destiny. And I just knew that the love that I never experienced in life, this was the love that I needed. And this was the love that I felt. I felt complete, not wanting anything, not lacking anything. And here I am today. I'm one of the happiest soul. If I don't have food in my refrigerator or in my cupboard, I know that the peace and the joy that God has given to me, no man can take it. Nothing can take that from me. Sister Judy, I didn't think when I was coming into this conversation with you that this would be a testimony, but this certainly has been a testimony. I'm talking to the incomparable Sister Judy Mowat, who is sharing an experience that there is someone out there that needs to hear that message. One of the good things about Judy's conversion to Christianity, you know, is that her music remains similar and always contains a positive message and always has all the elements that made it appropriate for the church. So tell us about the music that you're singing now. How do you quantify it? How do you classify it? It's gospel. But first I want to say that the songs that I did before, I can sing them in church. Absolutely, because there was nothing wrong yes, with them. The absolutely. message was still a there. A lot of the lyrical contents were taken out of the Bible. 
-hmm. We also found out one of the biggest things Judy learned from Bob Marley. That special thing Bob Marley always do in the recording booth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's funny. When we used to record with Bob, when Bob was doing his, his when he was doing his music, he would always take the Bible in the recording studio. Remember Marcel? Yeah. He's, and if you listen to his songs, he's yes. always talking Biblical about references. the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lord. Lord, I thank you. Mm -hmm. Lord, I got to keep on moving. moving. And I've always said to myself, I, would, I wanted to be like that man, you know? I wanted to know that the music that I'm doing is going to touch the hearts and the souls and the minds of people. I'm just so riveted just yeah. listening to your responses. Judy shared her experience about the day Bob died. Did she really knew that Bob had died before she were told? Is that possible? Listen to Sister Judy about how she felt something changed in the atmosphere and saw a light came over on Bob's picture. The day before it was that was a Monday, but the day before, Marcia and I, we were judges for the festival song. Mm -hmm. And we left the studio and she and I, we, ne we just never had a good feeling. We felt something was going to happen. And it was about 11 o'clock the Monday morning. I just felt, I just felt something change in the atmosphere. And it felt like some, somebody great. Because I think the elements <clears throat> hold on to who, like Marcus Garvey, great men. Rushing in know? the wind, yes. Yes, the wind, the, the, their music and, and whatever they stand for is, is, is in, the, in the atmosphere. And you can tell when somebody left, somebody has departed to go on to a higher level and it just felt like that the Monday morning and it's as if a light came and just lodged on his picture mm. and I knew that he had passed nobody had to tell me and then afterwards I was told that he was gone now we are into a story that could be the biggest Rasta controversy in ages this statement we believe is gonna have some Rasta man heads spinning round and round and explode. Judy told us that Bob Marley, the master Rasta, Bob Marley, was converted and received Jesus Christ before he died. Yeah. But prior to that, I would like to say again, because a lot of people are not straight and not sure if Bob had given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same, I think it was a Sunday evening, I spoke to Rita, his wife, and she said to me, she went in the room and he was going through great pain. And she hear him saying, Jesus, take me. And I'm saying to myself, that's too big for me right there. I, I don't understand that. I wouldn't even respond to what she said because I wanted to just contemplate on it. I the impact to, of those words. Yes, I just wanted to think about it for myself. To see. A Rasta man receiving Jesus Christ goes against everything Rasta stood for and been burning fire on all these decades. Can this be true? The man whose figure is regarded as the master Rasta was not a Rasta when he died, according to Judy Mott. Since dead man tell no tales, how can this be proven? Judy said he got Two sources of proof. First, Rita told her when she went into Bob's room while Bob was in pain, she heard Bob saying, Jesus take me, Jesus take me, Jesus take me. Judy also said it was confirmed again when she met someone who told her his sister was a nurse at the hospital where Bob died and she was the one who led Bob Marley to Jesus. And I never got the meaning until about a couple of years, I saw Bunny Brown from a group called The Chosen mm -hmm. Few. And Bunny said to me, Judy, my sister was a nurse at the hospital. And my sister is a steep Christian. And she was the one who led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Rita came in and she heard him saying, Jesus, take me. That before, prior to that, 
he was led to the Lord Jesus Christ and he accepted the Lord mm. Jesus Christ. That is a controversial statement, it Sister is. Judy, but it you is. stand by but your I'm statement. I'm speaking by what I heard. Mm -hmm. That was what I heard. And as I said before, people need to know if this is the truth, because as it passed through me, it came to me, and I'm telling you now, and I'm telling the audience that this is what I heard. But how could she tell what was in Bob Marley's heart? Bob Marley accepting Jesus Christ. Wow. What do you think? And you heard it. And I believed it. You heard it right here from Sister Judy Mowat. And I always say that, you know what? The word is power. And there is power in the word. Yeah. My goodness. I'm sitting here talking with Sister Judy Mowat. And she's being painfully, painfully honest. And you can tell that honesty reflects and resonates in the music that she brings, whether it was singing her days with the I3s, with Bob Marley, or as she's singing now, she's a committed woman. She's committed to her faith. She's committed to her family. I'm so glad that I'm here. And I will be performing on June 29th at Roy Wilkins Park, grooving in the park. And I am just so glad to know that I will be performing it at that, on that stage yes. for the first time. In a Marcy long time. And her friends. Oh my Definitely. goodness. It's really been my pleasure. It's been my honor. You've ministered to me today and I'm sure you've ministered to everyone in this room. Sister Judy, God bless you. God bless you and thanks for this opportunity. Thanks for watching this special Music Shacks presentation. Do the mod. Rasta turn to Jesus. Goodbye. Father, we bless you and we give you thanks and we give you praise for this time together, Lord. That we can come together, Lord, in unity, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have brought us together, Lord God. Oh God, we pray for your peace and for your righteousness and for your joy and for all the blessing of heaven, Lord, to go with us and to be with us and to sustain us, Lord. We thank you for your keeping care and for your love towards us. Oh, you have loved us with an everlasting love before the very foundation of the world, oh God. You knew that we would be in this place, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for this um, place, this backyard studio, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that it is a place, Lord, to use to uplift and to encourage and to bring out, Lord, the best and the positive vibes, mm -hmm. Lord, yes. to reach the people, Lord. Yes. We pray, oh God, that you will continue, Lord, to use the owner of this place, Lord God. Thank you for Judah Mort, Lord, and Marcia Griffiths, Lord God, for their continual, Lord God, oh God, support for the music industry, Lord, that helps to lift Jamaica, Lord God. Brothers and sisters, this is Judy Mowat, and I'm at the Music Shack having a wonderful time. Don't you touch that dial. Sing.